weeks as they start school, then fifth or sixth graders will then be expected to stay in service with us. Also, I did want to point out before we begin today that hopefully you remember at the end of our service, we have a portion called Thoughts, Questions, and Clarifications, just so that we can have a discussion where anything that comes up in the sermon today that you feel unsure about or anything that you want clarified, anything that you have a question about, we want to discuss those things. So if you have a question throughout the service today, write it down. We'll have a chance to discuss that at the, at the end once the live stream cuts off. That's just between us, all right? So just wanted you to be aware of that. Now, as we begin today, I want you to know that I am fully ready to admit that the Bible is pretty weird sometimes. It can be very, very strange. There are tons of weird stories, especially in the Old Testament. And today, at your request, because you voted for this, we're going to dive into a particularly strange and somewhat fantastical portion of the Bible as we begin to study today 1 Kings chapter 17 to 19. 1 Kings chapter 17 to 19 is where we're going to be today. This is the story of Elijah. Elijah is considered to be one of the most remarkable of all the prophets. And while we may only have a few chapters describing his life and prophecies, his miraculous and powerful signs and wonders, as this series is called, have led many to regard Elijah as one of the central characters of all of the Old Testament. In fact, Elijah is the most mentioned prophet by Jesus and the rest of the New Testament authors being mentioned in the New Testament 29 times. His short story is filled with strange occurrences and incredible acts of God. And as we begin to study it today, we should be careful in the way that we approach this. As we often say here at Aspen Grove, we believe the Bible to be true within its context and within its style. You've heard me repeat that many times because I want you to understand that. We believe the Bible to be true within its context and within its style. And that means that we want to be incredibly thorough in our understanding of what the Bible is actually saying, as well as how we apply that as truth to our lives. We read and apply historical narrative, which is what this portion is about today, differently than we read and apply something like poetic literature in the Bible or prophetic literature in the Bible. We read and apply those things differently because of their style. Does that make sense? And then most of all, we want to understand the full biblical context so that we can apply these things rightly to our lives as a reflection of who God is. We want to approach stories like we're going to read today from a right perspective. Now, the New Testament is the reason we do this, because it gives us some certain guidance in this regard. The well-known letter in the New Testament to Timothy, written by Paul, says this in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. You've likely heard it before. It says that all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. And that means that even the weird or the boring or confusing parts of the Old Testament still serve a purpose. They are breathed out by God. They are of the essence of God. They are part of God's larger story, and we should then try to understand them as such. Furthermore, it is right for us to read these scriptures with the understanding that there is something for us to learn from them. Even the strange stories of the Old Testament, there is something there for us to learn. <clears throat> they are profitable for teaching us about God, for correcting wrong behaviors that we see in our lives, and for training us to live as believers in the light of God's larger story throughout what we often call redemptive history, the story that God's been writing since the beginning. <clears throat> So as we begin today, to get into this story of 1 Kings chapter 17 through 19, I do want to do something that is maybe helpful for you in the long run. I want to establish four questions that a believer should ask themselves as you approach something like Old Testament historical narrative. Right? So the way that we read this, to understand it to be true in its context and its style, these are four guiding questions that really help us as we read these things. The first question we should always ask when we read Old Testament historical narrative is, what is the historical context? The Old Testament Hebrew scriptures are all about the big story. 
And sometimes that's hard to see when you only read little bits at a time. But we believe this to be true. God is writing a long story over thousands of years in the Old Testament. The Old Testament is heavy on history. And oftentimes, people that want to read the Bible do themselves a great disservice by flipping open the Bible, especially to the Old Testament, looking for a verse that's going to mean something to them and give them inspiration for today. Because it's likely that when we do that, we're missing what that verse is actually about. We're reading ourselves into things that maybe aren't always about us. The Bible is one big story spanning thousands of years, as I said, and much of it can only be understood rightly within that story arc. So to understand shorter passages, we need to understand where they fall within this historical story and where they fall within the shorter story that's being told in each particular book. The historical context matters. And the second reason we want to ask that question before we read something like this is because when we're saying what is the historical context, we are affirming that we believe these things to be historically true. Like I said, the style of the passage that we're reading today is historical narrative. That means that we do not read this as something that's a fable. It is not a tall tale. It is not a legend. This is something that was written down as, factual, as a factual historical account to be understood as such. So when we say that we ask, what is the historical context? We're affirming, we believe that these things happen. And I know that that sounds kind of basic, but when you read what we're going to read today, you're going to think to yourself, did that really happen? And the answer that we, that we say to ourselves is yes, we believe historical narrative to be historically accurate. Now, the second question that we must always ask is this. This is really the starting point for how we approach Old Testament narrative, and that is this. What does this story teach us about God? The reason we ask this is, like I said, we have a tendency to make Old Testament stories be about us. We have a tendency to read ourselves into the, these things, but this is what we want to understand. The Bible is God's story, not our story. And again, we, we don't need to rush to find some personal application or inspiration for each day. We want to understand the story that God is presenting. What is God revealing about himself? We believe scripture to be, as we said, breathed out by God. It is a revelation of who he is. So it's only profitable for teaching and instruction when we regard it as, uh, as showing us as who he is. That's what we believe about these scriptures. Now, there are many cases throughout the Old Testament where you'll see an Old Testament character that presents a good character quality. And a lot of people say, well, if, if so-and-so was brave or courageous or truthful or faithful, then we should read that we also should be faithful. And that's okay. But the better way to read that is, if this story is teaching me something about God, it's not just teaching me about a moralistic way to live. It's showing me that God led someone and even caused someone to be brave or courageous or faithful or truthful. That God instilled the qualities of those things as a reflection of himself. And in that way, the story is about him. Even those character qualities are about the work of God in the lives of those people. They're not just aspirational qualities that we're trying to emulate. Now, thirdly, we ask this question. As we read Old Testament narrative, we ask the question, how does this story connect to Jesus? Sometimes this is difficult, depending on how deep you are in the Old Testament. But we believe the entirety of the Old Testament to be leading to Jesus. In fact, we believe Jesus to be the culmination of all of human history. So we understand the Old Testament to also be leading to him. The stories in historical narratives often exemplify some aspect of the plan of God that would later be achieved in Christ. So again, returning to the idea of positive character traits in Old Testament characters, sometimes they exemplify certain qualities that are good and positive. But... They are always still sinners that have fallen short of the glory of God. And while we may rightly recognize good qualities that they have, we read them and understand those characteristics to have been perfected in Jesus Christ. So whatever positive things that we see as a reflection of who God is in the lives of characters like Elijah in the Old Testament, we know that whatever good thing that is was perfected in the person of Jesus Christ. We always want to read the Old Testament and say, how is this connecting to the person of Jesus? 
And lastly, then comes the last part, the thing that we often jump to, the thing that we often want the most is, what am I supposed to do with this? How am I supposed to respond to this? The last question we ask is, how are we to respond to this? Again, we want to be careful not to jump the gun and dig in quickly to personal application. And I hate to say this in a harsh way, but the Bible is not about you. And as we read this story about Elijah, you are not Elijah. But in the light of what we see presented about God and understanding the story as leading up to Jesus, we can then think through how ought we to respond to this. There is more to Old Testament stories than just minor characters for us to try and fail to emulate. Scripture is breathed out by God. We understand it first in relation to him, secondly in relation to the person of Jesus Christ as it is fulfilled in him, and then we see it as profitable for teaching, instruction, and application in our lives. Does that all make sense? That's how we're going to approach this Old Testament narrative together. So all that being said, before we dive into 1 Kings chapter 17, let's ask ourselves the question, what is the historical context of what it is that we're reading? Okay. For this, sometimes you have to do a little digging. You have to do a little bit of research. I recommend a website. You can see a picture of it on the screen. This is called um, timeline.biblehistory.com. That's a good thing to write down, timeline.biblehistory.com. This is an interactive Bible timeline, which you can dig through by period of biblical history, and then you scroll through it really by year. You can click on all of those things, and it gives you extra information about all those characters. It is a tremendous Bible study tool. Even It, it even has a search bar, so if, you're, if you come across a character in the Bible and you don't know where they fall on the timeline, you can enter it in there, and it'll show you exactly when they existed and show you fully the historical context of it, right? Now, that's a great tool for you to use at home, but for this morning, I want to throw up a really initially confusing-looking Bible timeline, and it looks like this. Here's in the next one. The, this is the Bible timeline I want you to see this morning. I know you probably can't even read it. <laughs> this is a pictorial representation of the history of Israel's kings and prophets. <laughs> this is the stuff that is generally covered in the books of First and Second Kings. And understand, you can look at this and be like, that is way too overwhelming. I don't think I understand this at all. It makes more sense once you begin to look at it a little better. This is the general history leading up to Elijah because he actually takes place towards the beginning of this timeline. So at the beginning, King David had really established Israel as a nation, right? He had done well. He had laid a great groundwork. And then his son Solomon takes over, and Solomon leads Israel into a time of great prosperity, they have so much wealth, they have grown in respect for the nations, but that eventually comes at a cost for Solomon. Part of their prosperity has come because Solomon chooses to marry hundreds of wives from all sorts of different nations and religious backgrounds. Now that causes sin in the form of idolatry to enter into the people of Israel via the king. He was supposed to leave them as being completely devoted to the one true God, and yet he has failed in doing so. So, not very long after his death, you can see Solomon at the top left corner of that blue piece. Not very long after that, there's a division in the kingdom. King Rehoboam and, um, begins to impose a new tax in the south. And Jeroboam, a leader in the north, decides we're not going to do that, so we're going to split off from you guys. We're going to become two nations. And very quickly, you see how quickly this devolves. The idolatry that was introduced by Solomon has caused the kingdom of God's people to be split in two. So the northern part is that yellow part there, and the southern part with the capital of Jerusalem is Judah. That's the southern green line at the bottom, and their various different kings. You'll see sometimes there's confusing overlap. There's some that take over. There's some that have co-regencies. They, they rule at the same time. All of that is there, and all of it's a little bit confusing. And then somewhere right over there beside or below Ahab, you see the beginning of the line, the blue part, which is Elijah. This is where we fall in our historical time period for this portion of 1 Kings chapter 17. Around the year 874 to 853 is the time when Ahab was reigning as king. And, spoiler alert, Ahab was a pretty terrible king. He had very little regard for the God of Israel. He hadn't even really grown up understanding how important it was to worship the God of Israel. And then he marries a woman named Jezebel, who you've probably heard of before too, right? And Jezebel is indeed the worst. 
She is a very manipulative wife of King Ahab, and she uses her power over him to cause a lot of trouble. You see, she is from a nation called Sidon, and in Sidon they worship the god Baal, the god of storms and thunder and rain and that sort of thing. And she wants her god to be the god that Israel worships. So she imposes this through King Ahab and says, your people are going to be worshiping this god. But he's like, wait, I think we're supposed to be doing something else. So he says, he puts out a decree to all his people, it is okay for you to worship whatever you want. Yahweh is good, the God of Israel is good, but if you want to worship the God Baal, you can do that too. You can understand why that's a weak position for a king to take. And in fact, it's so weak that his wife still isn't pleased. Jezebel insists, no, it must only be Baal because she understands that the God of Israel, Yahweh, is an exclusive God. She knows enough to know that their God demands full devotion. So she wants to eradicate that from the people altogether and insist that it's only Baal that will be worshipped. So this all leads up to a drought. There has been no rain on the land of Israel for six months. And now people are beginning to go to this god of rain, this god Baal, who their queen Jezebel has introduced and insisted that they worship. And they're going to this god and they're worshiping it, saying, we need this rain to live. We need our crops to grow. We're in a place where we are desperate to see rain, and we're going to go to the god of rain. And how do you think that makes the god of Israel feel? <laughs> Pretty upset, right? He's not going to be okay with this. So God is in a place where he is not happy with his people turning against him and worshiping a God that is entirely false. And that is the historical context that the entire story of Elijah rests on. A people divided, and a people in northern kingdom that are divided even among themselves about which God that it is their worship. Who will they serve? What God will they pursue? Will their desire for rain lead them into worse idolatry, or will they, will they turn to the one true God? That's the situation that Elijah is finding himself in. That's the historical context of the story. Now, as we begin this story, we're asking ourselves that, first, that second question. What does this tell us about God? What does this teach us about who God is? So let's dive in together. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1 says this. Now Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. So in this time of turmoil, as God often does, he sends a prophet, and in this case he sends the prophet Elijah, and we don't get a lot of background about who Elijah was or where he came from or how he became a prophet or how God called him. He just bursts onto the scene and suddenly has this conversation with King Ahab. He is a prophet from a little place called Tishbe, so he is a Tishbite. Just to give you an idea of how insignificant a place that is, um, archaeologists don't actually know where it ever was. It was like the smallest of small villages. They're not even sure exactly where in Gilead this place even was. Now, as a prophet of God, Elijah's purpose is to speak on behalf of God and implore the people and their leaders to remember God's covenant and trust in God's promises. So he has this conversation with King Ahab, and as he does, we learn a lot about God and about Elijah. He says this, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, and then he says there will be no more rain. Your idol worship of Baal will make no difference. Only the God of Israel will bring relief, and he will bring it by my own word. In other words, God's rightful judgment is given in the form of an extended drought. God is going to prove something here. that Their idol worship falls on deaf ears because there is no other God but him. So what do we learn about God in this? The first thing, the first blank on your sheet is this. This is what we learn about God from this short passage, this one verse. God alone is the living God. And he is vengeful against idolatry. <clears throat> we see this come up often in the Old Testament. God insists that he is the one true and living God. And the great and repeated sin of the Israelites in the Old Testament is idolatry. In their minds, it seems so often that they think that all gods must be the same, right? 
whenever we pray, we're just saying these things out into the ether, and whatever God is going to answer is going to answer. That's what they begin to feel like. They may think that a sacrifice is a sacrifice. A prayer is a prayer. We often think that today, too. Many people do. And what we see presented here is very clear. That's wrong. There is one true and living God. The, the God of the Bible is exclusive. He alone is God. All other gods are false. Now, King Ahab should have known this, but instead he chose idolatry. And for this, there are real tangible consequences. They can pray to Baal, the god of storms, all they want, but he will not hear and he will not respond because he is not existence. He, he is not existent. He is no God at all. There will be no rain until God speaks the word through Elijah. So the story goes on in verses 2 to 7. It says this. And the word of the Lord came to him. Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. He went and lived by the brook Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up, because there was no rain in the land. So, immediately after announcing this long, ongoing drought to the king, Elijah has to go into hiding. And you can imagine why this might be. God calls Elijah to go into hiding because he just told the king, unless I say it will rain again, it will not rain again. So what would be the natural reaction of the king? Get that guy and make him say that it will rain again, right? He was likely going to be captured and probably tortured until he spoke the words, let it rain again, so that God would do what he would do. God's not going to allow that to happen. He sends him into hiding. And um, as he does, we see something very important and a little strange. The next thing that we learn about God in this, the next blank on your sheet, is that God miraculously provides in unexpected ways. As Elijah is sent to this place, this brook in the middle of nowhere, where he can drink the water, he's worried about how he's going to eat, but God has promised him this, ravens will bring you food. <laughs> now, living here in Colorado, I have noticed We've got some pretty large ravens. In fact, there's been several Sundays when a couple have been sitting right on top of the school as I walk up, and there's those big black crow-looking things, and they kind of squawk at you, and they're kind of creepy and make you feel weird, you know, like a, a foreboding sort of sense, right? They're strange, big, ugly birds. And yet, God says those kinds of birds are going to deliver to you food every day, twice a day, meat and bread, as much as you want. Now, for me personally, I like to imagine those birds as little waiters, with a little waiter's apron on, coming down with a nice little basket of bread and another one with a little basket of meat. And the reason I put that in your mind is, I want you, the next time you see ravens, because they're everywhere here, I want you to think of this story of God's miraculous provision. Look at those big, creepy, foreboding birds and think, those were Elijah's waiters. They brought him the food that he needed. God provided in a miraculous and an unexpected way because God keeps his promises. You can imagine a little bit when God said this to Elijah that even Elijah was probably like, the what are going to bring me food every day? <laughs> like in no point in, at no point in history was this ever a normal occurrence for birds to bring people bread and meat, and yet this is what God has done because God is faithful. But as you might imagine, pronouncing a drought on behalf of God is a bit of a double-edged sword. And during his time, the drought also causes the brook Cherith from which he is drinking to also dry up. So for that reason, Elijah is going to have to move on. But keep in mind, Elijah has not given up on God at this point. In fact, he's probably more energized to serve God because he has seen God miraculously and unexpectedly provide for his needs. He just had bird-delivered food for himself for however long until the brook dried up. So he's pretty affirmed that God is doing something here. So as the brook dries up, he is not deterred. So look at 1 Kings chapter 17, verses 8 through 11. It says this. 
Then the word of the Lord came to him, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to feed you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, Bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So at this point, Elijah is now sent directly into enemy territory. He is sent into Sidon, which, remember, is Jezebel's home country. He is in the land of Baal worship. He is in enemy territory. And there he is supposed to meet a widow. And keep in mind, this widow, in all likelihood, was not a worshiper of God. She did not know God at all. She was likely an idol worshiper like the rest of her people. And as Elijah finds her there, just as God says, he asks her for water and a bit of bread, which is a weird way to introduce yourself, but there, there they are. And it goes on in verses 12 to 16 to say this. And he said, As the Lord your God lives, or excuse me, as she said, As the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar, and a little oil in a jug. And now I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my, and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, Do not fear. Go and do as you have said. But first, make me a little cake of it and bring it to me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, The jar of flour shall not be spent, and the jug of oil shall not be empty, until the day that the Lord send, sends rain upon the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, Neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So in this interaction between he and the woman, we see a couple of things happen. First of all, it does seem like in some way God has spoken to her. The God of Israel has kind of alerted her that this may happen. She's beginning to believe, likely because of the reality of the drought, that she knows that Elijah spoke over the land. Now secondly... She also reveals that she is so poor and destitute because of this drought that she was just headed back to her house, to, or get, gathering some sticks to head back to her house to cook the very last bit of food that she and her son had. This was their last meal. They were going to eat it and then wait for the cold embrace of death together. Pretty sad, right? Now, Elijah refuses to feed into the dramatics of the situation and instead is like, oh, you're going to go make some bread? Well, first make me a cake. <laughs> Give that to me first, and then you can go back and eat. Then he speaks the truth of the word of the Lord. The jar of flour will not run out, and the oil will not be spent, and we will eat as long as we are needed to eat. Elijah speaks the word of God, promising that God will feed them, and God does. Now, if you know the Bible well, you'll see this is a recurring theme throughout the Bible in which God multiplies what is needed for those who obey. God indeed provides in unexpected ways, miraculously, for Elijah and now for this woman as her son, as they together obey. As they live together under this strange and miraculous circumstance, things get weirder once again, as if the story hasn't been weird enough already. Look at verses 17 to 24. It says, After this, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. And she said to Elijah, What have you against me, O man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son. And he said to her, Give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up into the upper chamber where he lodged, and he laid him on his own bed. And he cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourn by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, 
Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Even living under the miraculous care and provision of God, here we see that sin and death rear their ugly head once more. The woman's son falls very ill and dies. And notice, in humility, this former idol-worshiping woman now sees the reality and the holiness of God in such a way that causes her to think that her own sin has led to the death of her son. She sees sin as having rightful and painful consequences. She understands what we say all the time, that sin deserves a punishment. But God continues to work. Elijah takes the child upstairs and lays his body over him in prayer, asking God to breathe life once again into this dead child. And God does it. So here's we read this. If we ask ourselves the question, what do we learn about God from this? I think the next blank on your sheet should be this, that God mercifully works miracles for the glory of his name. We see this often in the Old Testament. There is no denying this miracle. The boy was dead. Of this they were sure. But God alone is able to bring dead things to life. And he does so here in this story. But it isn't just so that the woman will be taken care of as she ages. It isn't just so that she can cease grieving. No, we see the real result of this miracle in her response as she says to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. God, the God, the one true and living God, is glorified because she has now turned in belief to him. She sees the word of the Lord as truth. This former Sidonian Baal-worshipping widow is drawn into the truth of our miracle-working, providing, loving, dead-raising God. This God is the one true God. He is right to cause drought on his idol-obsessed people. He has worked tremendously by providing for Elijah and the widow's family, even in the midst of all of it. And he has shown the greatest power of all by raising the dead. This bizarre story of the Old Testament shows us in short form this pattern of God. That he is holy, that he is righteous in judgment, that he is also merciful in provision, and finally that he, is, he alone is able to show grace in even raising the dead. That's what we learn about God from a story like this. So then we ask ourselves the next question, how does this story connect to Jesus? Well, in many ways, probably more ways than we could even list. For one thing, we see echoes of who Jesus is even in the story 800 years before he would ever be born because Jesus is the one true and living God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No other idols can provide what Jesus can. Not only that, but Jesus has proven that he provides for needs in miraculous and unexpected ways, the same way that we see happen in the story. Not only did he miraculously multiply food for people to eat, but he also raised the dead, like we talked about last week. But even more importantly, his miracles served to draw people into faith in the one true and living God. In very many ways, this story paves the way for who Jesus would one day be. So finally, we ask ourselves the last question. Understanding all these things um, in full detail, the historical context, what it teaches us about God, how it connects to Jesus, then we finally ask ourselves the question, how are we to respond to this? How do we apply this? What are we supposed to do with this kind of story? Well, I think this strange and unusual Old Testament story serves as a reminder to us of the nature and the reality of God. God is not some distant servant in the sky. He isn't some vague spiritual force. He is a holy God who demands the attention and affection of people like us. This God will not settle for half-devoted hearts, for double-minded people who want to serve two masters like Ahab did. He is the one true and living God. And while we are not Elijah, we would do well to stand as he did in full allegiance to God, even in the face of great risk and danger. 
We understand this to be true right now. There have always been and will always be cultural forces that demand you to bow to something else. And I think just a, a surface reading of the story leads us to see and understand our God demands that we bow to him alone. So one personal application for you this morning, just from the understanding of the story is, fully devote yourself to the one true God. There will be other quote-unquote gods or idols that will demand your attention, that will demand for you even to bow. But we do not bow. We are fully devoted to the one true God. Now secondly, consider what Elijah faced in this situation. He had to flee for his life to a place where he didn't even know if he would have food to eat. But God provided food even by the bizarre way of delivering it with ravens. There is at least some chance when we read something like this, oftentimes we feel like, man, if I could just see miracles like that happen in my life, if I could just see God provide in a miraculous way, then I would probably have more faith. I would be more devoted. I would understand him to be the one true God even more. Why do I not see bizarre, strange miracles like this happening in my life? I think the difficult answer to that is this. You work too hard to provide for yourself. You are your own security. You have surrounded yourself with every contingency plan so that nothing bad will ever happen. We live often so safely that there's really no room for God to provide miraculously for us. So I think one proper takeaway from the story could also be that maybe in service and devotion to God, we ought to risk a little more. And as we do in obedience to God, we might see God miraculously provide in unexpected ways. Now finally, think for just a moment about the raising of the widow's son. As amazing and miraculous as this moment was, that boy still eventually died. But in the light of the story, as well as what we know about Jesus, we have a greater hope than just a temporary resurrection. The life that Jesus offers to dead things is an eternal life. In him, we have true resurrection life that goes on forever, like we talked about last week. What was accomplished by God through Elijah in this story was perfected by God in Christ. Jesus raises the dead. And as we talked about last week, we look forward to being raised again with him to new and eternal life. So a third application then as we read a story like this, is I think we should grow in our appreciation and thankfulness for Christ and who he is. You see, the strange and intense story of Elijah, these bizarre signs and wonders that we have seen, should steer the heart of the Christian back to the cross. The cross is where God's rightful vengeance against idolatry was satisfied. It is where he miraculously and unexpectedly provided for our greatest need, which is our need for forgiveness of sins. And it is by the cross that we, like the sick boy, can be raised to new life. And as a result of all this, we ought to give glory back to him. God did an amazing work in the life of Elijah. That, that work is perfected in Jesus Christ. We have relationship with him because of Jesus. We can thank him for that, and we can live risky lives serving that God, knowing that he is able to provide in miraculous and unexpected ways. Let's pray together as we finish for today. God, we are thankful for the miraculous signs and wonders presented in the story of Elijah. God, as strange as these things may be, as fantastical as they may seem, help us not to see these as just stories or fables, but instead as demonstrations of the God that we know because of Jesus doing incredible things throughout history so that we may know him. God, thank you for teaching us and showing us who you are through the story. Thank you for guiding us to live in obedience to you. God, help us to have hearts that are not double-minded, that are not torn but instead hearts that are devoted to the one true God. Help us to be devoted in our walk and trusting in obedience. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand and sing as we finish for today.